This is kind of an experiment. This is the first time we've actually kind of done an announcement using Google Hangouts, and I've got an all-star group here with me. First off, I want to introduce Michael Hay, Hitachi Data Systems VP and Chief Engineer. Next up, I want to introduce Manju. We just call him Manju. Manju is our CTO of Intelligent Platforms. Hey, Manju. Hey, Greg. Next up, Robert Skoll. Well, Robert, you don't need any introduction. Hey, thanks for <laughs> – maybe someday. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for joining us. And last but not least, Mark Collier, CEO for OpenStack. Hey, Mark. Hi there. Good to be on. Nice to have you on, and, and really appreciate uh, all of you guys coming on, on board for this. And right off the bat, Michael, we might as well pull the covers off of this. Why don't we talk about what we at Hitachi Data Systems are announcing today? Sure. What we're doing is really announcing kind of uh, our involvement with the OpenStack community. And uh, our intent really is, is to, over time, invest in OpenStack to provide basically a, a private cloud option. It'll join what we've done, um, obviously, with VMware and Microsoft. Uh, and, and it'll you know, basically become kind of all the same in some sense. And um, more generally, what this is about is, is providing kind of scalable on-premise uh, private cloud infrastructures, especially you know, with all the stuff that's going on um, with our, our happy friend in Russia. Uh, there's a lot of demand <laughs> we're seeing in our customer base for really having an alternative on-premise that's, that's you know, fairly compatible with some things that are, that are out there in the, the public cloud world. So uh, you know, the activities that we're participating in right now, it's, it's uh, the release of the Cinder driver for the upcoming Havana release. Um, we've also done some work with Red Hat, and uh, fundamentally this kind of joins a long-standing commitment to open source that Itachi's had. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of improvements, for example, with KVM around performance and thinking about how, you know, real-time operating systems might uh, need to run in a, in a KVM bubble. So this, this just joins other things like OSDL, KVM, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it's really a great move for us, and I'm, I'm happy that we're a part of uh, the OpenStack community. And, you know, as our velocity of engagement increases, look forward to kind of uh, out there watching and see what we're doing. Absolutely. Manju, you've been you know, up to your eyeballs in this. What are some of your reflections on OpenStack? Um, you know, um, when we talk to our customers, um, w one of the big things that uh, really comes up uh, in most of our conversation is customers are looking uh, at OpenStack as a way of building their own differentiated uh, private cloud. Um, everybody wants to have something like, you know, how Google uh, or uh, Facebook has some unique differentiation in their data center, but they don't necessarily have all the resources and people available to build their unique uh, data center. And they're looking at OpenStack as a very good alternative option. They look at OpenStack and uh, all the community efforts that are going on in the uh, OpenStack, OpenStack community, and they take that, they want to put their secret sauce on top of it, so that they have some, some differentiated uh, strategy as well. And um, there are quite a few other alternate options uh, that are also open source uh, equivalent of OpenStack, but I think there is a tremendous uh, momentum behind OpenStack today. There is a, there's, there is a pretty strong confidence that uh, OpenStack is evolving as, as pretty much like uh, what uh, Linux has evolved as an alternate option for your uh, operating system, and there's a pretty strong belief around it. You know, that's what I'm seeing, um, you know, looking from our customer's perspective. That's, that's right. And Robert, I want to toss it over to you. Obviously, Rackspace was one of the co-founders for OpenStack, and you spent quite a bit of time talking to customers, startups. Uh, what are some of the reflections you're seeing from end users as it relates to OpenStack? Well, I, you know, when, when the team, when Mac and uh, Graham at at Rackspace and the other members of the team came to me, you know, what, about three and a half years ago or something like that and said, hey, we're doing this thing called OpenStack and can you help us get people to believe? And for the last, you know, I, I thought it was going to take five to seven years to get to where we are today with all the companies, CERN and Com Comcast and Hitachi on board. And so I, I think now we're really seeing a shift in what OpenStack is. It's it, It's moving out of this get people to believe phase and moving into a phase of, I say, t turn up the innovation engine without blowing it apart. And that's going to be interesting for, <laughs> for Mac to, because he's, he, he's up 
against a tough challenge. There's a lot of big companies with a lot of different interests involved in this in this OpenStack now, and in this foundation. And uh, you know, we all have different ideas of where the future is. I, I'm writing a book on it, so I, I have some ideas of where the future is going. You know, I'm wearing Google Glass, and I have a sleep sensor on. These new sensors are are streaming so much data up to the cloud, and if they're successful, and then if we start getting self-driving cars, those create 700 megabytes per second of data, and I know our clouds are not ready for that. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see all of us work together to get to this future. That's right. And, and I guess you mentioned that you've got your book coming out, uh, The Age of Context. Come out. When, when does that come out? November? November, yeah. It's, so it's about how sensors and wearable computers and machine learning uh, and, and social and local uh, data streams, which are all exponentially increasing. You know, Twitter is seeing a billion tweets every 36 hours right now. In 18 months, it'll be a billion tweets in 18 hours. And, and all these things are exponentially increasing, and that's putting deep challenges on our cloud technology infrastructure to get not not only just keep up, but then how do you in, innovate and add new things? I mean, Adobe's turning on and off twenty thousand uh, VMs an hour. That's incredible to think about where we were and what we can do today. And then you know what what if they want to do a million an hour? You know, are we ready for that? <laughs> That's right, it, Mark. You know, Robert brought up a good point about the about the ecosystem. Uh, why don't you tell us about the kind of the, the growth of where OpenStack's been and maybe some hints of where OpenStack is going with some of the releases? And I, just to add in here, uh, the Havana release will be the first release that Hitachi's uh, Cinder drivers uh, will be included. But mm -hmm. let's give us let's kind of take a look back at how this ecosystem has come together and where you see that evolving to. Sure. Well, I think, you know, early on um, we saw a ton of uh, companies uh, come in much faster than we expected and say, look, you know, we're interested in an open um, standard potentially emerging around, around cloud, and we think that, you know, there's going to be an opportunity here for uh, one kind of open platform to emerge as an alternative to some of the, the closed platforms and, um, so that grew much more quickly than we thought. I mean, when we when we actually launched, um, announced OpenStack, kind of launched the project, you know, we told the Rackspace board that we would get five companies to commit to at least, you know, standing with us on stage and saying, you know, this is a good idea, if nothing else. And we ended up with, you know, 25 companies, um, and, and some of them, you know, like um, Dell and others, you know, were really pretty early on to say, like, we want to see this, this move forward and then you fast forward three years and you know we went from the first summit of 75 people to over 2,600 people in Portland just a couple of months ago and we're heading to Hong Kong for our next summit in November and we expect you know many many thousands more to be to be in Hong Kong so you know there's we really have um, changed to a new phase I think as Robert said from kind of the early, you know, uh, idea phase and, you know, some of the early code and early participants too. We've got a lot of really big users now. You mentioned Comcast, you know, Bloomberg and others that, you know, if you think about that data explosion, I mean, Bloomberg looks at billions of, of pieces of information in terms of, you know, transactions and uh, financial data. And, you know, that's kind of been early on in, in this um in terms of creating tons of data, but now with social and Twitter and Facebook and all these, uh, every application becoming social, it is exploding, as, as Robert said. So I think that, you know, what we're seeing is um, a, a focus that's shifting in the OpenStack community to, you know, who's using it, how are they using it, what so problems are they solving, how is it impacting their business, and then where should the platform go from here um, to become, you know, more of an innovation engine, as, as Robert said. And, you know, what, what we hear... Uh, customers, users of OpenStack saying in terms of the benefits to them, um, when you talk to companies like PayPal and so forth, it's actually a lot about um, becoming innovation for their company. So PayPal's talked about how they're able to roll out new features more quickly to their user base by empowering their developers to spin up the resources they need. And what I think is interesting about that is not just if they know it's going to be a success, they roll it out, it's actually the ability to experiment um, much more like a startup. So they can have small distributed teams. They can try lots of different things. It doesn't cost a lot, and they can see what sticks and what doesn't, and if it gets a lot of traction, they roll it out to, you know, their whole user base. So that kind of thing that we think about making startups faster is also making larger enterprises faster because they're able to use, you know, cloud with OpenStack to kind of 
get that agility. Yeah. I just have to ask you: Do you, at times, with, with with the size of the ecosystem now, it, it's still growing. Do you sometimes feel like a cat herder? <laughs> you know, I think to me, um, we just love the passion that people have. I think you know when I see people um, just getting really excited and wanting to debate the future direction of OpenStack, and we see this huge growth. To me, that's all good news. Um, and you know, I think putting the right people in the right rooms together to, to hash things out is is part of what we do. It's why we have summits twice a year because you can't just do it all on online, um, even with Google Glass. Sorry, Robert. Um, <laughs> but uh, so you know, we have to get together in person, so we do it twice a year. And if, if that's cat herding, then you know, I'm guilty. But uh, it, it's fun, so we're gonna keep at it and just see, see where it goes. You know, there there isn't. A, you guys said it's uh, like Linux, but but there isn't a Linus Tor, Torvalds who's really uh, shepherding this. It's really a true community effort. How do you keep the focus on that innovation without having everybody spray into separate camps or or pull the the, the foundation apart? Sure. Well, I think that if you look at the governance model for how technical decisions are made. It's very similar to how the Apache Software Foundation works, yeah. which is a tried and true model. You know, um, they really blazed a trail. There's a lot of you know amazing work continues to go on every day under you know the guise of the uh, Apache Software Foundation. So you know we have elected leaders for each of the components within OpenStax, whether it's a compute or object storage or block storage, who are elected from within the community. And so they are in a sense benevolent dictators. It's just not for life. Which is you know the the traditional term people give to uh, you know open source um, founders that that sort of become benevolent dictators for life. So they're not it's not for life, and sometimes you know they they want to move on. It's a very big responsibility. But uh, we've already seen that happen where people who are leading projects as the uh, what we call PTLs or project technical leads you know led it for a couple of years and then decided to to hand off the baton. It was very orderly, and and new leaders emerged. So. You know, I think um, we just look at the results. The results are, you know, seven on-time releases in three years, and we've expanded the scope from just uh, compute and object storage to add in, you know, more sophisticated block storage. And you know, talked about Hitachi supporting Cinder, to you know, a lot of innovation in the networking side, and now we have, um, you know, a metering service. So the scope's expanded. I think the, the rate of innovations is there. So you know, um, if it ain't Broke, don't fix it. I guess is, is my answer to that. How how do you because you have a you know a, a few pieces that are are well are pretty mature at this point you know the storage infrastructure, but let's say a a, a couple kids get a Google Glass and want to build a new machine learning system that's uh, going to support uh, the sensors on this thing. Is that a place for open for those kids to come to OpenStack and say, "Hey, we should do X, Y, Z new thing"? Is that a, well? A I think that um, compute. If you think about um, the opportunity for OpenStack, is if you think about Android and iOS, you know they dominate in the smartphone, and their opportunity is huge. It's every smartphone on the planet, which will eventually be every phone on the planet, potentially. Um, and if you think about, you know, the OpenStack opportunities, every data center on the planet, you know, potentially could be OpenStack could touch that. And so, um, you know, any uh, it's a very universal need people have to to um, consume and utilize compute storage and networking. So is that going to be applicable to, you know, uh, the example you use? Absolutely. You know, maybe further up the stack, or it's it's more of an, a specific application that would leverage that. But I do think that there's a need. Uh, within the OpenStack community and, and um, you know, all of us to start thinking about how people are using OpenStack, how they're using cloud computing, and starting to make sure we're optimizing for those specific applications and thinking of it as a platform in a sense. And, you know, those are ultimately the drivers of using more infrastructure is, you know, are all these new apps that you're writing about. And so so I think that, you know, there is a, a definitely an opportunity for that. We actually have a track in our next summit Sorry, I'm a broken record about the summit because I love our summits. Um, they're very, they're <laughs> well, very they amazing. Should be. Please come to one if you can. Uh, it's it's really an amazing experience. But we have a whole track on called apps on OpenStack yeah. to sort of you know talk more about that in the summit. We haven't done that much before because it just wasn't the time. But I think the time's right to talk more about that. So, Mark, do you imagine that you're going to see an app store then, an app store type concept? 
that uh, will emerge, just as you cited, obviously, the Android marketplace and, uh, you know, cited some other things there as well. Is that something that's just kind of in the cards, much of what Robert talked about with, uh, you know, gathering sensor data and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I think people are starting to, to look at that. I mean, the, the, the term application in the context of kind of a whole data center is, is somewhat of a new way to think about it. I mean, traditionally, an application lived on one server, and it was Linux or right. Windows server. And now we have these, you know, quote-unquote cloud applications that span many, many servers. You know, people, there's Netflix has done some really cool stuff with their open source, open sourcing that a lot of the bits they use to, to be able to run. You know, you can think of Netflix as the world's largest cloud application. So that, that whole concept and the terminology, you know, is, is kind of evolving. But I, I do think that... Um, that over time, you know, it does make sense to help people match, you know, the types of uh, deployment patterns that underlie a certain type of application or scale with where you want to run it, which would be, you know, a variety of OpenStack clouds. So App Store, I don't know if it'll be exactly what we think of in the mobile context, but I do think, you know, cloud applications is a concept that makes sense as more and more people deploy things that just need huge amounts of infrastructure. It's no longer about, you know, one server. Well, and, and one of the things that we find as we talk to our, our users is the, the flexibility that you described, that kind of agile startup notion, and, you know, mix that up with the acquisition of, of what Robert talked about with a lot of sensors, be it a, you know, visual, audio, or, you know, just kind of clicking something going on on a train, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that almost provides the opportunity for, for different companies to kind of really, you know, the, the science part of data science, so to speak, is to do the experimental process, try it out, fail a lot, and then ultimately get to their conclusion, which will may be wildly different. I mean, my example I cite often when I talk to customers is, you know, I may have an idea, I may be gathering this sensor data, and I might end up with the next Lucite, and I want to yep. throw everything away and, and restart for, you know, optimizing for my Lucite, so to speak. And so we're finding customers are very interested in that sort of flexibility. We're also finding, um, and, you know, looking a little bit further out, there's some cool projects like the Square Kilometer Array that's in Australia and New Zealand. And that's kind of a challenge because you're talking about on, you know, on, on an equal basis, basically producing 10 times the traffic of the Internet. Yep. Right? So, wow. so you, you know, the Internet's roughly 80% of an exabyte a month today, um, depending upon which month you count. So you're talking about maybe up to 12 exabytes per yeah. month. And fundamentally, that means, you know, so, so Robert's right, it's going to cause a, a breaking of our infrastructure, but I think what's going on is all the people involved in, like, the Square Kilometer Array Project and other things are going, you know, gosh, maybe we have to move part of the cloud and part of the, the computation aspects out onto the boats that are doing oil exploration, out to the, you know, the telescopes that are yep. looking at the heavens, out to the trains, out to, and, and of course, as Hitachi, we're especially worried about some of those things um, in, in terms of, uh, how to how to build those apps that are not just on a, a large data center cloud, but there's maybe even a micro cloud that's on a boat. One of my friends is in the Thiel Fellowship right now. He's 17 years old or 18. I think he just turned 18. And he's building supercomputers in garbage cans with solar panels on top. So that might be the infrastructure that Could those be. guys need. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting the work that's already been done with uh, OpenStack and CERN because CERN is dealing with some of these issues of their their sensors are pulling too much data to mm -hmm. spray across the internet, right? They're doing a pre-filtering of it right next to the sensor and then right. doing a step of, of sensor filters um, so that, you know, when it gets over to Stanford, for instance, which is one of the partners, that, that their system can, their infrastructure can handle what's coming. Right. Um, Mark, Mark, are you seeing that that kind of work being interesting to OpenStack? Because that certainly the CERN thing yeah. is a big PR win, but <laughs> absolutely. No, I was going to mention CERN. Um, you know, talking about how they they have to throw away lots of the data just because there's simply no way to store it, and and then ever have any hope of analyzing, even if you can store it. And I, I do think that there's an interesting um, notion about you know people have talked about computable object stores or or different ways to to run, you know, and of course there's all the big data sort of frameworks out there that are exploding in popularity, but a lot of it's just about kind of, you know, getting the signal uh, to noise ratio right, and I do think it does become interesting when the, the, the influx of data is so large that you actually need to proactively filter it and just do some quick and dirty, you know, analysis to figure out what to throw away before you can even think about storing it and doing more analysis later, and we, you know, CERN is, is definitely you know, the example that I've heard of that. Um, but I know there are a lot of people that are thinking about 
um, you know, different tiers of storage, and I'm sure this is interesting to Hitachi, but, you know, trying to understand, you know, what needs to be um, accessible very quickly, what, you know, is more cost-oriented, and then, you know, when do you need to bring the data back online, if it's in some sort of cold storage, you know, based on, you know, all kinds of different algorithms, and so, yeah, I think OpenStack is very relevant to, to that, and, um, you know, we're just starting to see some innovation there and some features with um, the Sender project, for example, in the Grizzly release a couple months ago, um, you know, added the ability to kind of um, target uh, for the, the VM or the app to say, okay, I want, you know, uh, this tier of storage, and, you know, it'll pr provision it as a, as a block device and say, okay, you're getting, you know, slow, fast, cheap, whatever you're, your tiers are so that I think we're at the very beginning of that and I think you combine that with the ability to kind of move some compute over to where the storage is um, all those are interesting trends I think it's nobody knows where it's going to go but we know it's going to be fun fun ride to get there so I want to change gears on you guys real quick if you don't mind you know obviously one of the things that's been in the headlines lately is the whole Edward Snowden affair and a lot of the noise around this has been it's kind of straight transition to the enterprise from a public versus private cloud discussion. Robert, when you're talking to customers, are you hearing anecdotally concerns about public cloud versus private cloud? Is that is it, that entering into the discussion? Here and there, but not really, because the same rules are going to apply when you have the data in your own data center that apply publicly. The, the NSA is still going to tap the fiber optic link between Hong Kong and San Francisco, and they're still going to study the same metadata um, th and if they want your data, they're going to come and force you to give their data. That's why a couple of companies have shut down in the past two 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 weeks, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think you're still faced with the same challenges. What what I am seeing is a little bit of interest in where do you put your data centers, and that's Rackspace has to be concerned about that because and where is the governance of those data centers? You know, if you're uh, data centers in Germany, it's under a different governance than it, it is in the United States. So I, I hear about that a little bit, but I, I don't know that it's affected decisions yet. Um, right. It's certainly a talking point. <laughs> well, I, I think, Greg, Greg um, I do want to comment on that. I've actually, you know, begun to hear from U.S. customers concern over all, you know, the Patriot Act and all the things around it. They are considering it now their largest risk from a business perspective in terms of impact. And, um, so, yeah, we're hearing about it, and, and it's interesting, Robert, you talk about moving data centers into Europe. Well, you know, there's a pile of cloud standards that are getting stood up, and there's also obviously some fairly serious, as you've described, uh, privacy regulations that are actually transitioning from being optional to becoming potentially regulations. So yeah. you might, all of a sudden, we may have a new C-level office that's required globally called the chief, I think it's the chief privacy officer, if I recall. Um, you know, CDMI may no longer become a nice to have. It might be the way that we move in and out of uh, various uh, private public cloud infrastructures. So, yeah. you know, that's going to force a whole different potential area for us to think about as we're looking at the OpenStack community, which is, you know, how do we participate in some of the standardization activities that are out there? So, that, the hybrid cloud does help yeah. answer that, and we have a yeah. thousand employees over in UK, and uh, it. You know, this gives you your company some flexibility that we didn't have in an only public cloud world that we used to live in. Yeah, and I, I would just add that um, the thing that makes that possible is when you have the same open source code running, you know, a bunch of different public clouds you can choose yeah. from in a bunch of different countries, as well as, you know, the, because it's open source, you can run it in-house, and you can mix and match all these different things. And without that, um, you know, we've been in much worse shape right now, so... In a lot of ways, I think it's a positive that there's awareness now for people of just how many people might be looking at your data, um, uh, you know, whether you like it or not. And so in that sense, I think, you know, people to become more aware and, and be a little more conscientious of where they're storing their data is, is a positive. Absolutely. Right. Maju, I, I, I have a quick you know, question for you, Maju. You know, you talk to a lot of enterprises uh, and specifically about OpenStack, uh, if it's not privacy concerns, what are some of the priorities that they have established as they take a look at OpenStack? Yeah, I think uh, privacy concern is definitely one of them that we are hearing uh, now, but I think the, you know, the bigger reasons why they are interested in OpenStack are 
some of the things that I mentioned earlier, for instance, they truly believe that they can build their differentiated data center. They can take open stack code and make uh, put their secret sauce on top of it. They don't have to wait for some proprietary vendor to come back with enhancements. You know, um, they, they feel a lot more comfortable that they can take this source code and they can make some additions to it and build their differentiated differentiated strategy. I think uh, another thing also is that uh, um, th there is, the, especially when we talk to customers outside of the U.S., there is definitely concerns around U.S. companies defining what should be the standard for cloud management, right? And this is where I think what uh, Michael mentioned about CDMI is very critical. Um, it's almost like if you look at, um, you know, Amazon on the public cloud space or VMware, Microsoft, um, these are all like American companies. They're viewed as American companies and uh, from, uh, the com you know, companies that are based in Europe or uh, Asia Pac, they don't want uh, uh, American companies to be defining how their cloud should look like. Hmm. Um, they look at OpenStack as providing that uh, opportunity for them to define what should their cloud look like. And they're also looking at, you know, CDMI is a very interesting point that Michael mentioned. They are working on, you know, defining some standards around how the, you know, various components of the cloud should interoperate. And they're really, like, getting to a point where they want to influence how this communication ha happens, what's the standard that gets used, um, what is the protocol that's used. Um, they want to be able to not just uh, consume the uh, outcome of what this uh, sort of like the leading edge uh, cloud vendors are doing, but they also want to be able to influence how this is built for, uh, you know, their future consumption. I, yeah. I'm all into listening to Europeans. They designed the Internet, right? <laughs> it was designed at CERN. <laughs> and they made some very I, – I talked with the computer scientists over there. They made some very specific choices on protocols that helped us all out. So if they pick the right one again, I'm all for it. <laughs> you know, Mark, I wanted to ask you, the, the whole um, you know, geographic issues is also being kind of reflected in OpenStack itself. As you mentioned, the summit in Hong Kong is coming up. I think – is that the first summit – that has been uh, not in the U.S.? Um, yes, it is. This is the first summit. We've had a lot of events outside of uh, the U.S., um, usually like one or two day events, but this is, you know, the first full-blown global summit. You know, all of our summits are global, so people come from dozens of countries, but in the past, they've always been in the U.S., and this is the first one outside of the U.S., and it's very much reflective of how global the OpenStack community is, not just, you know, the ecosystem, but also all the participants, the developers, the users. I mean, one of the, my favorite facts that just uh, surprises me to this day is that more people visit OpenStack.org from Beijing than any other city in the world. Oh, so, wow. And, and, and that's, you know, honestly, a lot of just excitement, enthusiasm, um, and organic growth from, from local leaders there. I mean, I, I've, I've been to Beijing twice in, in three years, and so... Um, I, I would, if anything, I'd, I'd like to spend more time there. But um, you know, going to Hong Kong is a good place, I think, for a lot of people throughout Asia and, and all over the world. Really, that can host a, an event of this size. And you know, we, we've seen a lot of uh, excitement uh, in Japan as well, and, and, and other regions, other uh, countries throughout Asia. So it, it's good to be able to, to bring everybody together and do it in you know in another country for the first time. I gotta imagine that Europe's gonna be on the roadmap here eventually. Absolutely, it is. We're, we're, we're going to be having a summit next year in Europe, in fact, um, in the fall. So that's, that's on, the, on the schedule now. We haven't nailed down the exact dates, but we're, but we're definitely going to be having a, a summit in Europe next year. Do you know what city? We have not finalized the city, but we're, we're very close. Uh, probably within the next month, we'll be able to announce yeah. the city and the dates for, for the fall. Oh, and one thing too, Mark, do you want to give out the URL uh, that you guys have for the OpenStack Summit? Right now, you can vote on um, sessions at, that, that yeah. you'd like to see. Yeah, it's, it's openstack.org slash summit, and that'll just, that always directs to our latest summit that's upcoming, and we've had an unbelievable response. You know, we, we have all these speaking sessions, and, you know, the people of the community can uh, submit their talks. We had over 600 submissions, which is more than twice what we had for Portland. And since we put the voting online, 
Uh, we, we really improved the voting process, so it, it'll serve up a, 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 uh, an abstract from one of the, the submissions, and you just click you know, your rating, and immediately another one pops up. So you can cycle through them quickly, as quickly as you can imagine, you know, for being 600 submissions. If you really want to uh, rate them all, you can. And we've actually had almost 40,000 ratings uh, that have come in just since we launched this at the end of last week. So it's crazy how passionate people are and when we can put these systems together to let them express their opinion and people flock to it, it just it really gets me pumped up for where we're going with Hong Kong and, and next year. Isn't that great? Yeah. Mark, I also have to ask you, for some for folks that are new to OpenStack, if, if you were going to give them some direction on, on dipping their toes in the water with OpenStack, where, where would you point them? Well, there, there are a number of different um, places. Um, we have a, a page on, on our website that attempts to kind of summarize a few of the best starting points. It's openstack.org slash start. Um, but it kind of depends on, on, you know, your level of expertise and what you're looking to get out of it. For the more savvy users, there's a, an installer called DevStack. It's primarily designed for developers who want to have a local version of OpenStack running on their laptop so they can, you know, quickly do um, mm -hmm. code reviews and, and see how it runs locally and then submit those patches. But a lot of people like to use it just to, to kind of get a quick uh, installation. Um, it, it's not for production, but it is. It, a lot of people have, you know, flocked to that as, as a place to, to kind of quickly see how that works. Um, there's also a community-run cloud called TriStack, um, tristack.org, and um, that is a cloud that um, a bunch of people in the community have, have kind of contributed their time and, and servers and data center space to, to set up a cloud where um, if you don't feel comfortable installing it, you just want to interact with the control panel and see how it works. You know, that's now running Grizzly, so you can request an account on there, and it's, it's free, and the VMs get deleted every 24 hours, so obviously you're not going to run your apps on there, uh, hopefully, right. but it's, you know, it's not a, there's no free lunch, but, um, but you know, that, that's another way to kick the tires. And then if you, there are lots of different ways to install OpenStack. Um, there are a lot of people um, that use things like Chef and Puppet, mm -hmm. and SaltStack is a newer one, and Ansible. There are all these sort of DevOps tools for automating installation and management of, of different pieces of software, and all of them have recipes and cookbooks and so forth for OpenStack, and there are sort of micro-communities around those um, that you can go to and talk to. And then, you know, every major Linux distribution now includes OpenStack. So there's kind of a plethora of choices, and it kind of depends on your, your what you're trying to get out of your first. Yeah, and more tire. coming. I, I interview, I'm interviewing most of the companies you just mentioned over the mm -hmm. next, uh, if I haven't done them already, over the next uh, month or so. Server Pilot was just at, at our studio, and they're building a cloud uh, dashboard uh, control panel that uh, lets you control multiple clouds, not just OpenStack, but Amazon and others. And um, that's pretty interesting, and that, what they're doing is pretty interesting. Um, uh, on, on places for future conferences, uh, Mark, you should consider uh, Vancouver. The, the, uh, uh, the uh, convention center in Vancouver is stunning. It's the really? Best con yeah. Ted's moving there next year, and mm -hmm. it's the best convention center I've ever been to. It's... Uh, the views there and the and the way they're building and it's all um, lead certified. It's pretty pretty impressive. Thank you. Um, we always need those those um, those referrals because it's hard to find a place that can hold an event of our size now. So I'd love to check that out. You know, I, there was a so switching topics a little bit. There was a big debate in the community about APIs. What what API should OpenStack support and <laughs> all that, and we could get into that. But when I look at OpenStack's homepage, I see things like compute, storage, networking, dashboard, and shared services. That sounds sort of like what, what Rackspace's infrastructure looked like, you know, up to this year. I don't see things like uh, streaming or some of the newer workloads yet listed on your homepage. Tell me about where you think uh, OpenStack is going to go. Is it going to look like traditional cloud computing like Amazon and Rackspace Cloud look like? Or is it going to, in a year, going to look very different than, uh, than that? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, we haven't really made the shift in terms of talking more about the applications that run on top. It's something I definitely think we, we should do over the next year. And I mentioned, you know, we have a dedicated track for that at the next summit. So I think we'll be learning more. A lot of it has to do really, especially in open source, with 
learning who's using it, how they're using it, and letting that kind of pull you forward into the future where you're supposed to go from an open source perspective. And that's it's somewhat different from, from commercial software because, you know, if you think about things like Linux, I mean, Linux is everywhere. It's in your car. I mean, it's, it's all over the place that you wouldn't think of. And, you know, Android. It's in my glass. <laughs> yeah. Glasses. Um, Android is use. Linux, right? And it's running my glass. So, yeah. yeah. Yes, Android is Linux. And so, you know, the same thing is happening with OpenStack. It's getting used in ways that we could have never imagined. So I think it's kind of, uh, in some ways, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, have a great crystal ball and know where things are going to go. But I do think, you know, there are certain use cases where you're going to see um, communities kind of um, uh, come together, you know. So we know that there's a lot of people, for example, in high-performance computing, they're using OpenStack, so you know they'll kind of have their own micro community of OpenStack people on HPC that'll be you know um, improving the support for GPUs and and you know really trying to uh, up the bandwidth um, in every bottleneck in the system. And then you have you know service providers that are going to be trying to go after cost, and there may be a number of those that are looking at ways through things like um, oh uh, what is the this there's a a new um, Swift feature that's in the works to uh, that I'm suddenly blanking on um, that's you know going to make it a lot more cost effective to um, you know to store objects erasure, without erasure needing, coding erasure coding yes yes yes, yes. <laughs> I, I figured a, a, bunch, a bunch of Atachi guys should know the know this so, yeah, erasure coding has been around for a while um, in the industry but it's it's now coming to OpenStack object storage so that'll you know radically change the economics. So there'll be people that are that'll be kind of driving um, uh, the state of the art in uh, in how low you can drive cost, um, and then I think there'll be some interesting use cases combining compute and storage that we talked about earlier, where you want to move the compute and the storage, you know, right next to each other. And a lot of these things come back to physics, right? Like you have a data center, and you, when you, especially as these the amounts of data get larger and larger, you know, do you want to have all your storage on one side of the data center and all your compute on the other? Or do you want to mix and match them? And if you just want to build a generic one-size-fits-all cloud and, and that's all you're going to do, you're going to make a lot of sort of compromises. But I think that as more and more companies rely on cloud computing and look at it as a competitive advantage, they're going to want to design and implement it in an optimized way. And the code may not be radically different, but the implementation may be much different to hit their goals. And it'll become a competitive advantage for companies to design and deploy their OpenStack cloud to really fit their application. And that's, if you think about what Facebook has done, right, that's what they did. They built essentially a cloud, a data center operating system to run Facebook. And, you know, they're not running OpenStack because it didn't exist back then. But I think that five years from now, the next Facebook may very well be running OpenStack in a very highly specialized way for their workload to hit the economics and performance. Right. Um, that would be a very exciting outcome to me. It, you bring up a good point there. And one of the questions that, that I have for you, Mark, is how much uh, – what from a growth perspective, from an adoption perspective, how much of the challenge – is kind of um, the internal resources that enterprise IT departments have as far as you know, uh, building uh, OpenStack-based solutions. How, how much of a challenge is there on that, or are you finding people gravitating toward this pretty quickly? Well, can, let me add to that, Craig. I, I think I've certainly run into customers that are very interested in, in OpenStack, even in CloudStack, um, but they are falling back to VMware, to Hyper-V, because of the lack of domain experts. The, you know, enough domain expert to basically give them the opportunity to move into that area. So, you know, we've obviously, there's been somebody who said that that represents lock-in that's a good thing, which I'm befuddled by, but, uh, you know, that's, that's <laughs> certainly a top of mind of some customers is the fact that they've got to go get DevOps folks either at the application layer or they've got to make their, their you know, admins, be it network compute storage, more application developer friendly, you know, and, and the whole DevOps movement is quite interesting because, in effect, what it's doing is it's it's turning compute storage, networking, and other elements that may be invented in the future. You know, Robert, you mentioned streaming. There's there's other aspects. Those are becoming objects in my program, and uh, it, you know, it reminds me back of a, a silly aha moment I had one day when I was you know typing on the Bash shell. It's like, oh my God, I'm a living program. 
Um, <laughs> and that's really what DevOps is about, right? It, it's two things. It's it's the it's becoming the living. The programmer is becoming the sysadmin. The sysadmin is becoming the programmer, yeah. and your program's alive. Um, but it's also about the return of the systems programmer. So the main thing that's oh, yeah. are coming back. Well, I think that's one thing that Rackspace is working on is working to get more people into OpenStack uh, through a n number of different efforts. I think that's one of the uh, last phases of the first phase, which is uh, get people to believe. <laughs> yeah, and, and at the foundation, you know, one of our priorities this year and next is training and helping to foster the training ecosystem and the materials, you know, both sort of the, the official documentation of the project, which is all online, and, and continuing to get more people to contribute to that so people can learn kind of self-paced on their own, as well as really encouraging um, the commercial ecosystem of companies, including Rackspace, Mirantis, uh, Stexo. I mean, there's a bunch of different companies that offer paid training classes, and there's a huge demand for that because there is absolutely a talent gap. So, so I would not, you know, tell you that that isn't a problem, but I do think, um, you know, where there's a problem and there's interest from, from big enterprises, it, it's pretty f quick to see how uh, people will fill, that, fill in the gap in the free market and, and with the foundation's help, you know, what we're trying to do is just really um, f foster that, promote those, those op opportunities for people to go get trained, whether they're free or paid. And so it is a big focal point for, for the foundation because we, we know that, um, you know, there's, there's over a thousand job openings in the OpenStack community, which is good in the sense wow. that, you know, in a world where we have high unemployment, we've got, this odd paradox where we have all these job openings, but you know, I think that um, that is going to correct itself. <laughs> that there will be a market correction in a good way to to you know staff people up, train people up, and you know people are are going to gravitate towards this, and we'll have a lot more trained, knowledgeable people that can help those companies you know throughout this year and next. You know, as we get into the home stretch here. Um, uh, for this hangout. I want to go right down the line here. I'm going to start off with you, Robert, and then we'll get to you, uh, Michael, next. I want to ask you, kind of, where do you see the roadmap, um, not from, necessarily from an OpenStack perspective, um, but from a Rackspace perspective? Uh, obviously, OpenStack is an important element to that, but how do you yeah. see uh, but, customer adoption with Rackspace growing? Well, I, I wrote this book to sort of uh, lead into a white paper that will be you know, published to the, to the employees next year, which is about where I think the world is moving to, and it's moving there faster than my book could get written, which is <laughs> amazing. But, uh, you know, this is going to be a, a, a decade-long age. Uh, sensors are not going to stop, stop doubling in numbers for decades. Um, uh, you know, I've already, I visited Park just last, last week, and they were showing me that their inkjet printing circuitry on anything, so your Snapple can is going to have a, a a circuit printed on it with a little radio and it and a sensor, and it's going to tell whether this has been outside the operating range of this food, and it's going to be done for very low cost, right? Think about that. Think about if almost everything you touch has a sensor on it and a little radio, and it, it is able to spit data around. So. Um, you know, it, Rackspace has been seeing this for a while, and it, it's just, uh, it's called, I call it contextual computing or age of context, but I, I'm excited. I, I think there's a lot of work to do, and, you know, it's, uh, it's a fun, fun place to be in and talk with the strategists about where they're going to build new things. I, certainly, uh, you know, you saw us uh, uh, acquire Object Rocket, which makes yeah. uh, MongoDB much faster. And by the way, we can't keep up with demand. We can't buy enough machines fast enough to keep up with the demand of Object Rocket. Because um, customers are going into this new age and want faster and faster and faster, and they're being asked to do more with the machines that they're that they're deploying into this world. Um, so it's a, it's an exciting time. It's a it's a race. <laughs> and, it, you know. It sure is, and, and Michael, you know, we're just, uh, you know, this is uh, our beginning on the on the journey with with OpenStack. Uh, obviously, we've got a portfolio around private cloud, but where do you see this kind of evolving from a Hitachi data systems perspective? Where do you see that roadmap taking us? 
Well, I'm going to you know bridge off some some things that Robert said because as Hitachi, we're a devices company, kind of at our core business, and we see a lot of the same things. You know, how do we make our mining devices intelligent? How do we improve the safety margins on operating trains? So we're we're desperately, in a good way, you know, and passionately in a good way, concerned about you know, how how that stuff actually works. So I can certainly foresee a future when there's a, a micro open stack. And that's, that's why I was kind of touching on that a little bit earlier, that we run out in, you know, run on a boat, run on a train, run in a mining device, where I can have parts of my application, you know, sharded at distance, not just, you know, the database scaling out like you would do something with a MongoDB. Um, so I could see that as something, and I surely I couldn't tell you the horizon on it. In the near term, you're right, Greg, it's really about enabling uh, existing portfolio to be relevant, um, and I think that's the trajectory we're headed down. Um, I, I do believe that, you know, we're, we're in the era, and, uh, you know, Mark brought it up very well, where I can, I can build my own cloud, and it's going to have characteristics that I bring to the table. Yeah. And that's going to potentially result in some new specializations around hardware development. So there's, there's a lot of discussion around commodity hardware, and I'll, you know, be the first to say I hate the word commodity because we don't have, so I guess I can go buy Intel chips out of uh, Chicago right on the commodities market. That's the wrong answer. Um, we have off-the-shelf components, and what's going on in the industry is is exactly what Robert and, and Mark and and Maju and you will will talk about. And that's there's a systems thinking. So it's not that the 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 systems are getting less expensive; it's that the systems, the vendors, are being required to deliver them in new ways, and they're they're bigger. So the aggregate cost is the same, and that's that's leaving open the door for innovation. Add GPUs, think about new bandwidths, do you know uh, software-defined networking, and I, I think that's probably a space that Hitachi will also look to innovate in over the long term. Mark, I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. So where does OpenStack go as far as, obviously, I think the release schedule is, what, every six months uh, yes. yep. for, for new releases. If you kind of project, I know you you, you, know, you don't know exactly what's going to come out from one release to the next, but if you look at the direction that OpenStack's going, what kind of kernels can you pull away from that and share with us? Well, I think, you know, um, you know we're talking earlier about it, OpenStack, micro OpenStack running on, on oil rigs. I would just like to see it run in, on Mars, just for the record. Uh, <laughs> if we're going to dream big, I'd like to get it off this planet. But, um, you know, I, are you, I think... Are you announcing a collaboration with Elon Musk or something like that? <laughs> oh, man. Are you, I, I love... It, 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 it's called HyperStack. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm a big Elon Musk fan, but uh, if you're out there, Elon, call me. Um, <laughs> no, but, no, I, I think that, you know, you mentioned software defined networking. I mean, that's obviously a very hot hot topic. Um, I think it's, you know, it's very early in that game, but uh, OpenStack has been one of the first places people have, have gone. Um, it was actually uh, the OpenStack networking project, codenamed Neutron, is is one of the areas where, uh, you know, companies like NYSERA first, first rolled out their products as, you know, plugins, and a lot of the folks at uh, NYSERA actually helped write and architect the original OpenStack networking. So I think you'll see that kind of the last uh, unvirtualized or unautomated, if you will, um, you know, areas of the data center, um, even in, you know, advanced automated data centers is the network. But um, I think that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out, not just with more plugins, but more users. You know, everything is interesting in a Petri dish in, in a certain way, intellectually, but when you get it out in the field, it always works differently. Everything always breaks at scale, as they say. So I think networking is the, the next or final frontier, maybe, in terms of virtualizing and automating things in the data center. So there'll be some interesting stuff happening there. And then just, you know, big data. I um, hate to fall back on another buzzword, but, I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously happening. There's people running a lot of Hadoop on OpenStack. And, you know, there are ways you can optimize your deployment and potentially the code within OpenStack to be a better place to run Hadoop, um, you know, platform as a service, um, uh, pla uh, you know, solutions or platforms, if you will, or open source projects like Cloud Foundry and OpenShift, you know, they're, a lot of those are running on OpenStack. So just the kind of uh, shift in thinking to, okay, you know, we, we need a very basic ability to turn on and off uh, uh, resources to, you know, understanding the applications better, their behavior, optimizing the code, optimizing the deployment for the application, those are all kind of the big trends I think you'll see in the next few releases, um, you know, kind of reflected there. That's great. Maju, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Obviously, you're talking with customers and, and uh, talking about how 
Hitachi Data Systems integrates with OpenStack. Where do you see the future, and not necessarily from a, from a product perspective, but from the demands that you're seeing from customers? Um, so I guess uh, probably twofold. You know, one is if you look at uh, traditional data center customers, uh, the demand for the future is really around uh, um, making their infrastructure as easily accessible, programmable as their applications are. Right. Yep. That they look at OpenStack uh, being an enabler for that. You know, the apps are so easily programmable, you can write an app on top of Twitter that filters out what you don't want to watch, for instance, um, uh, or like you may want to hold off and then come back and uh, watch it later. But infrastructure is not there yet. Um, so they look at uh, OpenStack being an enabler to make that in, you know, infrastructure more intelligent, more programmable, more easily accessible to do different things that may be, you know, things that are uh, proactive, the things that may be reactive. Um, I think there is a lot of opportunity in, within the infrastructure to evolve um, in that area. Um, but you know that's one set of the customer, right? These are the traditional uh, data center customers. But we also talk to you know some of the customers that Michael was mentioning that brings the Hitachi overall uh, into the perspective, not just. Uh, Hitachi data system and the traditional data center uh, background, right? There are a lot of our customers who also have investment outside of uh, data center uh, uh, components. You know, these are like the industrial internet, internet of things. Um, there, there, you know, there are people who are definitely talking about. Michael mentioned a square kilometer array project, for instance. Uh, we've got sensors there, you know, with uh, different uh, industrial uh, devices. How do we interconnect the data? In some ways, it brings back the big data point to the picture, but really more from an infrastructure point of view, how do you interconnect the devices? Some of them that may be sitting in the data center, some may be sitting outside in some edge. Uh, what type of uh, infrastructure do you need to have to be able to have this uh, communication happen between you know, you know, things that are not necessarily sitting inside the data center and the things that are sitting in the data center, and they're looking at uh, you know OpenStack uh, be one of the enabler to interconnect that infrastructure and uh, make things that are like you know sort of almost like a fluid the way you, you know um, they they should be able to get to a point where they can interact uh, smoothly with their data center infrastructure and the things that are sitting outside in the field. That's right. That's right. And we're going to uh, tie things off right now. I'm going to go right back down. Manju, uh, obviously your Twitter handle is up on your screen now. It's it's it's, at, it's the network uh, is your Twitter yes. handle. I used to work for Cisco, and uh, there you go. <laughs> if that's a legacy Twitter handle, then I take it. <laughs> but I believe in it. I mean, it's really at the end of the day, it's the network that brings back all the things that we've been talking about, right? There's so much more intelligence that's in the network. I do believe in it. That's right. And and you you also have a blog where we talk a little bit about OpenStack on blogs.hds.com. So folks can, can go there and ask you questions and harass you on there, right? Yes. That's right. All right, Mark, how can people uh, how can people uh, stalk you online? Your Twitter handle is uh, at Sparky Collier, right? Yes, yeah, Sparky Collier. Um, hit me up on Twitter. It's a good way to go. Um, I, I also forgot to confess earlier that I actually registered edwardsnowden.com. So, did you really? <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, Mark! I heard the uh, party at the next summit is in his hotel room, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I can't confirm or deny that. But, uh, oh, wow. oh, but the NSA could. <laughs> <laughs> Look, no matter what, this this video chat will be archived in several different data centers. I'm sure. That's right. <laughs> but, yeah. Sorry, Sparky Collier. I'm on the OpenStack blog as well. That's outstanding. Michael, how can folks stalk you online? Yeah, so I'm at, at MIA42 because 42 is the answer. We just don't know what the question is. But, <laughs> uh, and you can come heck, you can come check us out on the HDS community. So that's that's kind of the uh, the social network. We have the Innovation Center up there where we're, we've got some good debates going on. Uh, come on by and uh, come engage with my myself, my team, and other folks from the Hitachi community. That's a good point, Michael. We will be uh, archiving this video in the communities there to continue the discussion 
after this as well. So uh, thanks for, for bringing it up. That's community.hds.com. And last but not least, Robert. I don't even know why I need to tell people how to stalk you online. You, you, well, I'm, I'm easy to stalk, but I, we do publish our videos with innovators and startups on building43.com, um, which is Rackspace's site for uh, uh, helping startups out. Which is outstanding. And one so last time. What's the correlation between 42 and 43 there? Oh, uh, you know why? Uh, I was trying to come up with something that said something about this is the center of the internet and uh, Google's headquarters. The if you go there, uh, Larry and Sergey sit in Building Forty Three. So I figured that's actually the the real center of the internet. So I stole the name <laughs> Building Forty <laughs> Three. That's outstanding. And, and Robert, your book is you have a definite uh, published date in November yet? Yeah, we're we're having a party in uh, San Carlos, November seventh. So we're, we'll have copies on Amazon before then, but though. No. And it's called the Age of Context. Yeah, and it's uh yeah we did I don't know three hundred interviews of people from Toyota to Oakley to um, Plantronics to Facebook about where this future is going. It's pretty interesting stuff. That's outstanding. Well, I want to thank our audience for, for watching this live, and obviously our audience uh, that's watching the archive version of this. It's been a pleasure to host this and ha have such a great panel discuss OpenStack and private cloud. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, and we'll talk to everybody later. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank